First, I'd like to thank the Fetzer Foundation and the organizer for that nice meeting. I've heard so many nice talks about physics since yesterday, so I'm a little bit ashamed of what I'm going to say myself. You know, I'm just a mathematician, so I'm going to make a few mathematical remarks about the notion of weak value. Well, uh, I would like to thank Basil Heidi for many fascinating conversations about the topic. But, yeah, learned very much from him. Okay, so actually I shortened a little bit the title of this talk because I realized that 20 minutes wouldn't be enough to talk about Born-Jordan quantization in addition. Well, Born-Jordan quantization might very well be the correct quantization scheme, but so let's work with the weil wigner moyal quantization scheme, which is probably incorrect, but I mean, sufficient for all practical purposes. Okay, so what I'm going to show you is that the notion of weak value uh, introduced by Haranov, Weidmann, and their collaborators can very well be described in terms of phase space quantum mechanics. I mean, uh, and I think that it even gives more insight about that notion that seems uh, actually rather complicated to many on which button should I pick here? Uh -huh. Which one? Show me. <laughs> oh, it's there. Yeah, this, this one? Right. Yeah. This one. Well, but to, just to the right. Just to the right. And to the left if I want to come back. That's right. Good. Okay. Yes. So here I'm presenting the usual blah, 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 which you know so much better than I do about the notion of weak value. You have a state coming from the future, you have a state going forward in time, and then you have two different evolutions. At some intermediary time between the initial time, Ti, and the final time, Tf, okay, something happens here. And you can define the notion of weak value of a certain observable with respect to the post-selected state and the pre-selected state by this formula here. This is, I think, the classical definition. Anyway, this is the one I have learned. Now, there's another way to represent these selected, post-selected and pre-selected states. is by using the Wigner formalism. I think that physicists are more or less familiar with that. Uh, the Wigner uh, formalism is not used by all physicists, okay? Uh, it's a originates in the early work of Wigner, who wanted to find the substitute for a phase space uh, probability distribution, and he more or less pulled out of thin air an object, W psi here, which is the Wigner transform or Wigner distribution of the state psi. It's defined by the formula W psi xp equal to, then you have the integral with a certain coefficient there, and indeed W psi has correct marginal properties. That is, if you integrate, integrate with respect to momentum and with respect to position, you get the configuration space, probability density, and the momentum space density. Now, of course, look at these expressions. They, they, they are not very nice. I mean, well, where do they come from? It turns out that W psi has a very simple, actually two very simple interpretations in terms of operators. Uh, but let me first show you how actually this applies to the, to the notion of weak measure. Sorry, should I come back here? Yes, I should go back here. Okay, let us denote by pi hat the parity operator. Well, it's the operator which changes a wave function psi x into psi of minus x. That's a very simple operator. It's a Hermitian operator. Actually, it has two eigenvalues, plus or minus one. That's it. And let's then define t hat xp. Uh, that's the displacement operator, well, familiar from pe to people working in the theory of coherent states, just represents a phase space translation here. And define p hat xp by conjugating the parity operator with pi. Well, that's also a reflection operator, parity operator, but this time with respect to the point xp. It's often called in the mathematical literature the grossmann royer operator. Well, and then making a few simple calculations, you can check that the Wigner transform of psi is up to a constant, just the expectation value of the parity operator. So, in a sense, you could say that W psi measures 
of how much Psi is centered about the point XP. So this is already one definition or one redefinition of the transform. Another one I will not really discuss here is that if you, if you view W Psi as an observable, it's a real function, W Psi is always real, so you can view it as a physical classical observable, then its quantization is just the projection operator on the state Psi or on the ray emanating from Psi. All this is well known in mathematics, perhaps a little bit less in physics. Well, so let's go back now to the notion of, of weak values. Okay, so instead of talking just about the, fi the state Phi plus Psi at time t, I calculate its Wigner transform. And the Wigner transform being bilinear or rather twice antilinear in Psi and Phi, you get what I read in the first line, W of phi plus psi is the sum of the Wigner distributions of phi of psi plus a cross term, twice the real value of W psi phi, which is given by the formula below. This is called the cross Wigner transform. The cross Wigner transform is actually the call that the polarization of the Wigner transform. It's also a very well object, very well known object in mathematics, especially in time frequency analysis and in radar theory. It's a measure of interference. In time frequency analysis, it's often called the short time Fourier transform when you view the variable x as time. And it's Fourier transform, the ambiguity transform, which I wrote down the last line, it's also called the radar ambiguity transform, and it measures correlations between states. This can be useful sometimes to think about the parallel, actually, between what happens in time frequency analysis and quantum mechanics. It's quite instructive. We're going to see that the weak values actually are witnesses of strong interferences, or if you prefer, of strong correlations. Good. So. Let's see how we can express all this correctly. A hat here is the quantization, the vile quantization of a classical observer AXP. Well, AXP might be any real function. We can also admit complex functions, in which case A hat is not Hermitian, but okay, I'll be a little bit vague about that. Then by definition, the vile operator is given what I read in the first line there. And actually you can, you can express the, the average value of a hat in the state psi using a formula which was found by Moyal a long time ago, his famous paper about quantum mechanics as a statistical theory, by writing this there. That is, if we have in mind that the Wigner transform is a kind of probability distribution, this formula, this Moyal formula shows that the expectation value of the operator a hat is just the weighted average of the classical observable with respect to the quasi-probability function W psi. Uh, it's a, usually it's really only a quasi-probability because W psi can take negative values. It actually only takes positive values if psi is a Gaussian function. Okay. This was proved a long time ago by Hudson, Janssen, other people, and well, the proof is not quite trivial, but it's true. So this is why we talk about a quasi-distribution function. Actually, the negativity of W psi can be an asset because it shows deviations from the classical regime. Fine, how about the weak values? Well, weak values, we can do the same thing because Moyal's formula can be extended, as I show in the first line here, quite easily by using the same mathematical methods, by saying that, well, A hat between phi and psi is the weighted average of the classical observable with respect to the cross Wigner distributions. That's rather easy mathematics. I mean, easy in the sense that you only have to shut up and calculate. That's it, and you get that result. I'm not talking about convergence problems here. That's outside our scope a little bit. And hence, you can express the weak value as a quotient between this average and the scalar product of phi psi, of course, phi psi are assumed to be non-orthogonal. Good. And the cross Wigner transform satisfies those generalized marginal properties, which reduce to the usual marginal properties when psi equals phi. 
Uh, and using these, you can prove that rho phi psi equal to the cross Wigner transform divided by phi psi is a complex probability distribution. This has been considered in a few papers and, uh, well, but perhaps not very well exploited. Okay, more interesting is the following example here. I take for the pre-selected state and the post-selected states Gaussian, that is, centered at a point x0, that is, on the right, or the left, that is for you, that's the left side, you have one Gaussian, and on the right side, you have another Gaussian, and you have zero just between them. That's a Gaussian cat state at time t. Okay, if you calculate the cross Wigner transform, you get also a Gaussian, but this time in phase space, multiplied by a certain exponential factor, which depends on the location. Notice that if x0 is zero, well, then the both Gaussians collapse to one Gaussian, and you just get a pure Gaussian. That's also a very well-known result here. Now, as a classical observable, I choose, I mean, this is a little bit, of course, non-physical, I choose pi h bar times the Dirac delta at the point zero. Okay, you can see that at a very sharp localization operator in phase space. If you do a few calculations, then you find that a hat its quantization, the corresponding quantum operator, is precisely the parity operator. Seems a little bit strange. On the other hand, you can think that the Wigner transform of this just measures how much psi is centered about zero. Okay. If you now calculate the weak value with respect to psi phi, you get an exponential oscillating factor times an exponential which can be as large as you wish. If the Gaussian states are far apart, x0 is large, and the right-hand side goes to infinity. So this has, it can be 100, hmm. it can be 1 million, it can be whatever you want. And that's very different, of course, from the eigenvalues of the parity operator. Okay, it should be pi there, which are only plus or minus one. So, I mean, for me at least, there's no mystery of uh, weak measurements having very large values, 100 and whatever you want. I mean, that's just a mathematical fact. That's all. Okay? But I'm a naive mathematician, I know. <laughs> okay, let's go a little bit further here. Now, another question is, okay, if you have the pre-selected and post-selected states, you can build the Wigner, the cross Wigner transform. That's just an easy mathematical exercise, you do some calculations, and you get it. Now, the nice thing here is that if conversely you got the cross Wigner transform of them, which can perhaps be measured experimentally, I don't know, then you can reconstruct both the pre-selected and the post-selected states. That is, the knowledge of W psi phi uniquely determines the states psi and phi. This is not universally known. I mean, in time frequency analysis and radar theory, it is known because in radar theory, for instance, psi would be a signal you send, and then phi would be the echo of that signal mixed with something else here. Now, the nice thing here, look at these formulas here. There's a lambda. What is lambda? <coughs> lambda is whatever you want a kind of ancillary or auxiliary state you choose as you like. It's totally arbitrary. So in other words, psi and phi can be written in infinitely many equal ways. And I think, I suspect, but I haven't proved it yet, that this might be useful in the theory of mutually unbiased states. And also, by the way, in the theory of super oscillations. I've been corresponding a little bit with Michael Berry, who is so, so one of the experts on that, and uh, this is probably true, but this is still a research, ongoing research. I think that if you use this cross Wigner approach, actually you get many, many insights by using simple mathematical things. By the way, if you take a look at the integral there, exponential of 2i over h bar p x minus y, and lambda 2i minus x. This is exactly the parity operator around xp applied to the function lambda. 
I hadn't rewritten that in this form, but it is rather obvious. So the parity operator and the cross Riemann transform seem to play a fundamental role, mathematical role in the theory of weak values. And the important thing, what, which I liked doing this, is that the knowledge of the interference term, remember that the cross Riemann transform is an interference term, uniquely determines both the pre-selected and post-selected states. And intuitively, I'm not a physicist, but it makes sense. You have a signal coming from the future, another coming from the past, and when both collide, so to say, you have strong interference, which can be measured, which can be constructed, and mathematically exploited. Yeah. Okay, uh, just back here, one second here. Oh, of course, yes. If you take lambda equal to phi, uh, phi is normalized, then you get a very simple function, a very simple uh, formula. But this presupposes, of course, that you already know what phi is. The advantage of these formulas here is that lambda is whatever you want. You choose it exactly as you like. Good. How many minutes do I still have? Five. Excellent. So now uh, just a few words about the original title of this talk, Born-Jordan case. What's Born-Jordan quantization? It's a good quantization. Born-Jordan quantization was the, the quantization, quantization scheme introduced by Born and Jordan working on Heisenberg's matrix mechanics. And in order to make it mathematically sound, to make it work, they introduced the second rule there, which associates to a, polyno to a monomial, XRPS, the average, this is 1 over S plus 1 here, of all the combinations P, S minus K, X, R, P, K. And their theory only works if they use, if you use this quantization, quantization scheme. Okay, for historical reasons, this scheme was replaced by the Weil scheme a few years later. Weil never actually wrote this formula. Weil wrote the formula I showed you at the beginning of the talk. But in a monomial case, it was shown by McCoy, actually you get this here. And bo both are actually different as soon as R and S are larger or equal to two. But for historical reasons, okay, it was the triumph of the wild quantization. It turns out also that you can notice the differences because if you take a Hamiltonian function, classical Hamiltonian function, kinetic energy plus potential, then you get exactly the same quantization, whether you use Weil or born Jordan. But you have differences if you want to quantize, for instance, the square of the angular momentum. This apparently has led to, I know that Basil Hailey will contradict me about this, it has led to the so-called angular momentum dilemma. You know, if you use wide quantization, you don't get what Bohr had, had actually predicted. You get uh, an error of one-fourth of h squared, which disappears if you use Born-Jordan quantization. And anyway, I mean, wave mechanics and matrix mechanics are only equivalent if you use the same quantization. And matrix mechanics, does only work if you use, actually, the born jordan scheme. So the conclusion for me is obvious, but OK, this is still, it's still possible that there is no unique quantization scheme to be this. And actually, the second, party of, the second part of my talk would have been to write a, a generalization of Weil quantization. The first one, a hat Weil, is what I showed you at the beginning. But if you quantize an arbitrary observable, a la bj, then you get that there. That is, you have to multiply the Fourier transform of the observable by an oscillating term. That's actually the sinc function, the sine cardinal function, familiar from Kirchhoff diffraction, as Basil pointed out to me. And actually, this leads to a different uh, Wigner or phase space picture, which is much more complicated than the usual wild picture. And of course, it also modifies the functions for, uh, for uh, uh, the weak values. But I mean, uh, it's perhaps hard to detect at this level which is the right quantization. And OK, so this will be my talk in two years. Then. <laughs> OK, here are just a few references. OK, uh, hmm. there are rather circular references, but uh, Okay, I, I explain detail these things in uh, 
in 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 the first reference. That's a Springer book, which is going to appear, and there's, there will also be a physics reports paper also on Bohr-Jordan quantization. Okay, I thank you very much for your patience. <laughs>